And we're now joined on the Voices for Victory podcast by Dr. Shruti Nayak. Uh, Dr. Nayak, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me. I am great. I am joining you from New York City, from NYU Langone Health. Um, and you know what? It's always wonderful to talk about basic research and how it advances cures for cancer. So thank you for having me. Uh, it's our pleasure. Uh, there's a lot I want to get into with you on on the research that has been funded by the V Foundation you've been working on and so much more just generally about, about the field of cancer research. But um, to start with, anytime I have uh, one of our researchers on on the podcast, I also like to I also like to get a feel for you know how you got to where you are today, what sort of your road, your your path you've traveled to get here was. So, what was you know when you were growing up was not even specifically cancer research, but was science always something from the time you were a little kid? Hey, this is where I think I'm going to go with my career. Oh God, no! I was never the smart kid. I was always the funny kid. <laughs> so I actually really wanted to be a stand up comic. Um, I like. I avoided science and math classes. You know, I still need a calculator to do most things. Um, but but I actually was watching TV one day and I was, you know, somebody really remarkable came on, um, this professor, Bonnie Bassler, at um, Princeton University, who studies how bacteria communicate with each other it, it, and basically uncovered this really fascinating thing, which is if you have, you know, just one bacteria sitting in a dish, it just behaves like a normal bacteria, but as it multiplies and grows and builds a quorum, uh, it can communicate with each other in very different ways and turn on the color green, so green fluorescent protein. And so there were these glow in the dark bacteria that really talk, taught us about how cells interact and multicellularity, which actually is quite important for our understanding of cancers, which are cells that are multiplying and proliferating and how a cell may behave when it's a singular cell versus a big tumor is maybe very, very different. Um, so I was inspired by Dr. Bassler um, and I took a microbiology class because what 16 year old doesn't like glow in the dark stuff, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's basically um, how it all got started. That's so interesting and it's funny how no matter what field you end up going into, right? A lot of times, um, again, no matter, no matter where you're headed, it's that one person or, or thing that really motivated you and kind of lit the light bulb, right? That said, hey, this is something I might be interested in. That's so. Was there because I can't leave the stand-up comic thing just standing there. I have to ask you more about that. So, was there like a stand-up comedian that you were like, that's this is who I want to be when I grow up. I want to be this stand-up comedian. Or what? What was it that really was it? Just you were the class clown, and and that's what everyone expected you were gonna go. You know, do? honestly, so I immigrated to the United States when I was like eleven, um, and. Let me just tell you, the Amer American middle school is like the most brutal, you know, place on the planet. Like it's so I think the way I survived was humor. Um, it was a really nice cultural conduit to talk to, you know, other kids in school. And, and so that sort of became this way that I could connect with people, despite the fact that I was from a different place and I sounded very different and my food smelled different. Um, you know, I think laughter is something that we share universally as, as human beings. I don't think I could have ever fathomed like this life um, for many reasons. I think a big part of it is, um, you know, girls are not often taught, pushed to be in STEM. Um, it just not. So, I mean, I think things have changed quite a bit since I was in middle school, but I still think this this continues to be a problem where math and science, these things where, you know, people typically associate with smart kids, women are not encouraged to go into those fields. And there's tons of data out there, you know, in the classroom, teachers sometimes call more on boys than girls, or there aren't as many um, heroes or as many people that girls can look up to um, in the sciences to, to sort of say, oh, I can be like that person. Um, and I think that might have had a lot to do with it. And I think seeing someone like Dr. Bassler, who is this remarkable scientist, but also a remarkable person, she's very engaging. She's, you know, when you talk to her, she was very excited. Um, I think seeing that and seeing that you can be a woman and still be really successful in science and there is this um, this way forward was really important. So while I couldn't have imagined it as a middle schooler, I'm very happy that I got to be in science because I think one thing that that maybe your audience may or may not know is that 
it's such an awesome job. Um, it's intellectually fulfilling and having that possibility of um, advancing cures is emotionally fulfilling. So it's, it's been great. So in, uh, in, in 2019, you received a V scholar grant from the V foundation, which um, when we've talked to our V scholars, they're pretty, um, you know, pretty much all on the same page on the importance of these type of grants to get young researchers going. Um, what did getting that grant mean for you in your career? Yeah, maybe we could just take a step back and just talk about how science is funded. So there's, you know, despite the fact that there's a, there was a pandemic, right? And that we, you know, that we suffer from many, many health crises, cancer being among one of them, diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases. Science is actually not well funded in this country. It's not even one of the top funded initiatives in the country, right? And most funding generally comes to the government. And and the other sort of a sort of not so great feature of this is that young people, where most of the ideas come from, find it the hardest to find funding. So the ones who are the most willing to go out there and do risky science and ask those off the beaten path questions that could really lead to new cures have the hardest time finding funding. And I think this is where so I think the V Scholar program really addresses both those issues in the best possible way, which is finding scientists really at the start of their independent career. So right when they're starting their own independent laboratory and saying, we're, you know, you've performed so well, you've done so well in your discovery so far um, that now that you're going to venture out into your own, we want to give you seed funding to really go after these ideas. And that's kind of what the V Scholar program did for me. It was a really, right after I had started my laboratory and having that money allowed us to have the runway uh, to one, stay afloat, but two, ask about how, you know, inflammation impacts cancer predisposition. And, and, and I think that was transformative because it allowed me to stay in science and in a way that it may not have been possible without it. And you mentioned there a, a line on how inflammation impacts cancer. And that's kind of the focus of, of, your work that was funded by the V Foundation. Tell us a little bit more about, about what you're looking into there and, and what you found in, in so far as you've been getting your lab up and running and and uh, just kind of give us the big picture view of, of the work that you're doing. Yeah, so I think we, we hear this word inflammation a lot, right? And I just taking a step back even from cancer, like what is this word inflammation? Uh, because it seems like uh, it could be a lot of different things. And I think if we break down inflammation into two different categories, acute and chronic, um, things start to become a little more clear. So acute inflammation is the stuff where, uh, you know, you have heat, pain, redness, swelling, um, and and you kind of feel the inflammation, but then it goes away, it resolves. And chronic inflammation is like a low-grade stealthy inflammation that isn't very often detected, but actually causes a lot of damage and promotes cancer. And this type of inflammation has been studied in the context of cancer well. The type that hasn't been studied nearly as well is acute inflammation and what happens after we undergo these inflammatory bouts. Like you have a sunburn, you have a rash, you have, you know, a minor infection. Those things largely go away, they resolve. But how do they alter your susceptibility to cancer-causing agents? How do they change the way your body reacts to cancer-causing agents has not been well studied and that's what we study. And the reason that's really important is because when people think of cancer, they think of a mutation. Um, and then you have this mutation in the cell and it grows out of control. But the truth is many of our cells are mutated. Mutations are a normal part of cells dividing. They cause, you know, we know this now because there have been studies where people have looked at mutations just in healthy skin and they find that there are a lot of cells that behave perfectly normally that have mutations in them. Um, but I think the key difference between one that progresses to cancer and one that doesn't is still unclear. And we think a key element of that progression is that inflammatory component. So if we could identify what those components were and then mitigate them, get in the way, intervene early, right? Could we stop cancer from ever forming? Could we predict people sort of cancer predisposition and, and help them make lifestyle choices um, that would divert that outcome. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. I don't want to just find cures. I want to find prevention. Right. Um, and so that's the goal of our research. So what's kind of the roadmap to get us there? What, it, what does it look like when you look, uh, you're looking at, here's what our work's going to look like, um, you know, X months, years down the road, what's the path you're taking to get to hopefully, you know, where, where you want to be at the end? Yeah. So I think we actually need to lay a lot of groundwork in this space. So we really are at the stage of, you know, fundamental grounds to truth based discoveries in um, in animal models with animal studies, uh, where we, you know, expose animals to different acute inflammatory mice, we primarily work with mice to different inflammatory exposures, like an infection or a sunburn or a wound, um, and then look to see how that immune response changes. And what happens if we give a carcinogen, right? And so once we sort of understand what those pathways that are changed are, then we can start looking in in human populations to see how many of those are really associated with um, early cancer formation and early, and then you know ultimately intervene and say, okay, well if we if we develop inhibitors for those, or if we have sensors that can sense them. And people, would they tell us that this person may go on to develop cancer and we need to really start paying attention and, um, you know, monitoring their, their sort of cancer development more or um, uh, their, their choices, modulating their lifestyle choices more. So that's kind of the roadmap, um, you know, and I think that it really is all going to be at the end of the day about helping people be healthier, increasing health span and, and prevention, um, in my opinion. And we talked a little bit about the V scholar grant and it's the importance of the program, um, before you dove into your research there, but, um, you mentioned sort of laying the groundwork, building the foundation. I know that's, that's what these V scholar grants are meant to do, right. Is really get, get everything built up so that then you can take what you've built and go find more funding right. to continue the research on it. Right. Is that, is that sort of how the process lays out for you as you're, as you're building this yeah, up? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's very funny. My mom always asked me like, what's taking so long? Uh, <laughs> she's, a, she's like, why haven't you like figured this out yet? Um, and I think, uh, I think a lot of people wonder like, why does this take so long? Why do we not have a cure yet? And the truth is science is really hard and meticulous. Right, we're solving one of the most complicated puzzles in the world, our biology, um, and so it really does take a lot of time. It takes a lot of intellectual effort. It takes a lot of financial resources, um, and so having funding from places like the V Scholar Grant, I think, is like ideal in the sense it really lets you start putting the pieces of the puzzle together in a careful way at the stage of your career where you can use that to build upon um, and, and, and sort of create this tiered effect of discovery. Um, and so I, you know, I often say to my mom, like, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not as fast as you mom. I can't just like code an answer to this, this problem. Right. Um, but, but at the end of the day, we want to be careful. We want to be careful with our discoveries because we want to help human beings. And, and that's not something that we take very lightly. Um, that's not something that we we want to rush. We want to be, I think, being careful and and erring on the side of caution is really really important. Well, I'm glad you said that too because that's something we like to make sure our donors and our supporters are aware of is that like you know these things do take a while. We've had some amazing, yeah. um, you know, since the V Foundation's creation in 1993, the expansion of uh, treatments and, and more research has been incredible, but there's still obviously a lot of more work to do and that it, it takes time to, to get to that work. So I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that too. Um, one, one thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, Dr. Nike is, um, diversity in research. You mentioned this a little bit earlier that, um, you know, women haven't always had as many opportunities in, in the science and, and math field. Um, how important is it in specifically the field of cancer research, but science in general too, to just have a, a diversity of thoughts and backgrounds in the space um, when, when you're all sort of working together here toward, towards a, a common goal. Yeah, I think this goes back to this idea of like, how do we problem solve? How do we solve puzzles, right? Like if I was to ask you, so if you and I were in a contest in how to solve a puzzle and you could have three people on your team, would you pick three people that were just, would you clone yourself two times over or would you pick two other people who thought very differently than you? Um, and 
my answer is I would every time pick people that were very different than me because we could approach that puzzle from different angles. Uh, and I think, you know, that is to me the essence of why we need diversity. We need diversity of thought. We need diversity of expertise. So we need to approach cancer from a genetics angle, from the immune system angle, from metabolism. Cancer metabolism is very different than metabolism of healthy cells. From, you know, uh, like literally cell, bio cell biology, how these cells behave, um, human physiology, our exposures. So not only having a diversity of scientific perspectives, but a diversity of individual perspectives is really important. And in order to do that, you really need people from different backgrounds, right? Different lived experiences, different ethnicities, different you know, cultural backgrounds, different educational backgrounds. So at the end of the day, the advantage is really if you want to make breakthrough discoveries, you have to find people that think differently and get them to work together. And this is where I actually think the, uh, it's not just the funding from the V Scholar program that's really great, but you have the yearly retreats uh, where you bring people together, right? And and you bring people from different backgrounds, clinicians, basic scientists, uh, from all over the country together. And that I think is also transformative in advancing discoveries. Yes. And we, we just had our, our V scholar summit in, in May last month and was a, a wonderful event. Great to see a lot of our, a lot of our young researchers and they were, they were all of them that I talked, I talked to a lot of them for some content we're putting together and all of them were just so happy to be in the same room as each other after a couple of years of, of COVID and not being able to see each other. And you could tell how excited they were to talk about their work and, and collaborate and, um, I think uh, I think it was Dr. Uh, Chad Hurry said to me, um, uh, you know, science doesn't happen in isolation, right? Science happens when we collaborate and we work together, and um, and that's something that that the V Foundation has been very supportive of. We want our, you know, we want to help promote that, and and the V Scholar Summit is certainly something that we we do for that. Um, speaking, if you were to to speak directly to a potential donor to the V Foundation uh, who's considering making a gift to support cancer research. Um, what would you say to them to explain why supporting cancer research now is so important? I think we're in an era where technology has really opened doors for us in ways that even five, 10 years ago were like inconceivable, right? And so cures have, are like within reach. And I think the, and the other thing that is really fantastic is uh, we really have a lot of smart people working on this problem. The one limiting factor is the money, the resources, right? And so that is really what's going to get us uh, over the sort of finish line of, you know, how do we get immunotherapy to work 100% of time um, instead of depending on which cancer it is, you know, 30 to 80% of the time? Like, um, how do we come up with new combinations of therapies? And can we co-opt cancer therapies for other diseases? I mean, uh, so one example of that is CAR T therapies, which are these engineered immune cells that attack tumors, right? People are now starting to co-opt those for a number of other diseases like fibrosis-based diseases that really damage organs, um, atherosclerosis, you know, various uh, conditions uh, where you have blockages. Um, and so remember that when you support cancer research, you're supporting finding cures for cancer, but you're also supporting finding cures for, you know, a number of other diseases that may not have the same uh, patient populations, but impact humans in really profound ways. Yeah, that's, that's really well said. And I know um, the one thing our, our donors do know about us is, is that 100% of their donation is going to go directly to cancer research. Um, Dr. Knight, a last question for you, and we will, uh, we will get you out of here. Um, what would victory over cancer look like to you? I think victory over cancer would look like not just finding cures, but finding preventions. So not only, you know, and again, this is within our reach, I think. Um, not only, you know, if someone develops cancer, we detect it early and we intervene early. So not another life is lost to cancer. But if we could say, you know, here is your cancer risk and really early on, not just based on uh, genetics, but your environmental exposures and prevent cancer from ever forming, then to me, that's an ideal world. Well, as long as we keep funding uh, talented 
uh, researchers and scientists like yourself, uh, I am confident that, that we will get to where we want to be. And uh, Dr. Nyack, I know if if you can make it to one of our V Scholar Summits in the future, we maybe set you up with a stand up set. We'll get you up on stage, have you tell a few no. jokes. Um, you know, harken back to your to your younger days when you thought comedy My might be. My type five is not that good. Way. You don't want to do that. <laughs> Uh, well, Dr. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for all the wonderful work that you are doing. Um, and we are very excited to continue to see how you grow and your lab continues continues to do amazing work. So thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much.